Welcome to Face to Face, and today we're going to talk about politics, we're going to go to Europe, we're going to talk about the Ukraine situation, we're going to talk the relationship Europe-Russia, uh, or the non-relationship uh, now, or the conflicting relationship. Of course, we're going to talk about the Europe and the US. I'm with Arle Schlanger from the La Rouche, the spokesperson with the La Rouche International Organization. Arle, welcome to Face to Face. David, it's a pleasure to be on with you. Thank you so much. So do you want to, to introduce yourself maybe a little bit more? I know you have been working with Lyndon LaRouche for over 20 years. Um, anything to add to this? Well, it's actually close to 50 years uh, until his passing. <laughs> uh, I was his spokesman for the last 20 years of his life uh, for the United States. Uh, I've been in Europe since 2016, where I've been working very closely with Helga Zeplerusch, who's the founder and chairwoman of the Schiller Institute. So I've continued to represent the ideas of Lyndon LaRouche, uh, which, as you know, are quite controversial, but also quite prescient. No, it's very close from our, uh, I mean, as a humanist uh, and nonviolence organization, I find I follow... Uh, Uh, here I am very much in contact with Diane Saar here in, in New York, yeah. and uh, uh, we are working very closely in many issues, and we, um, we are going along very well. <laughs> so, so well, Diane is a very good spokesperson for our organization as well. Yeah, I got there on the show a couple of times already. So, yeah. and um, um, no, really, we, um, we, um, we have many... Uh, Many, in many issues, we have the same view. Yeah. So let me start with, uh, I want to understand and uh, how do you see the situation in Europe? Uh, my point of view, uh, or how I see it, it's in some way uh, the US brought uh, Europe for $196 billion dollars in aids and military uh, uh, help in Ukraine. So... Um, Anything to say about this? Did you, I'm totally wrong. <laughs> well, I, I think to, to really understand the situation in Europe, you have to go back to 1989 and the period of the collapse of the Berlin Wall and then the collapse of the Soviet Union. And at that point, there were two possible options. One would be what LaRouche was proposing, which is that the Western countries should help with capital goods export technology to build up not just Russia, but Eastern Europe. And instead, what was done was shock therapy. What was done was using Eastern Europe as a kind of Mexico-type situation with the United States. Cheap labor, cheap raw materials, uh, demographic crisis of enormous uh, disaster for Russia. Uh, the promise not to move NATO eastward was violated repeatedly by the West. And this put the Europeans in a tough situation. Uh, because they benefited from what the U.S. was doing. They made money from it. Uh, Germany especially, the, as Russia started to recover under Putin, Germany was getting very cheap natural gas and oil from Russia, which helped yeah. fuel Germany's economic development. Yeah. Now, this, from the standpoint of classic geopolitics, and I mean geopolitics as in the, the tradition of Brzezinski and the British geopolitician Mackinder, the idea of a German-Russian relationship is a great threat to the power of the city yep. of London and Wall Street. And so the attempt to break it, and I'm not saying the total reason for the Ukraine situation is to break Germany from Russia, it's to break down Russia. But the Europeans had very good reasons for siding with Russia. And it took enormous pressure from the United States and from the British, don't underestimate the British role in this, to cause the Europeans to go along with the policy of war in Europe, especially, think about this, German tanks rolling across Ukraine toward Russia. This brings up for everyone in Russia, the Nazis in World War II. So this was a, a tectonic shift in German politics, and I think it's going to possibly end up breaking apart NATO. So you think it's going to break... Uh, NATO or Europe or both? Well, at this point, the, just recently, the European Union and NATO issued a declaration saying their interests are exactly the same. They're parallel. And that's what we're seeing, that the European Union financially depends on the United States and London. 
Uh, militarily in the past, Europe depended on the United States. And now the U.S. is saying to Europe, you've got to put all of your military capability behind Ukraine. So they're pushing the Europeans into a, a situation where they're at the edge of a cliff. Now, the problem is that this is a suicide policy for countries like Germany. Germany is, is caught between two things. One is the green transition, yeah. which is not going to work. There's no way you can sustain a, a, an advanced industrial economy in Germany on solar and wind and, and weaning it off oil and coal and gas. So that's one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is they're making Europe a party to a U.S. attempt to destroy Russia and take Russia apart. Finish the job, you might say, from the 1990s. And this goes against the interests of people in Germany. It's cold here. It's not as cold as they thought, but people's utility bills have gone through the roof. The cost of transportation has gone up. Inflation is, is having a tremendous impact. And now we're seeing job losses because German companies that depended on cheap oil and gas are now moving out of Germany, looking at the United States and China as an option. So that's a little bit why I was thinking then, then in some way the U.S. got control of, if you control the energy in Europe and you control more or less the military, you control the, the whole, the whole uh, community because uh, there is no, I mean, nothing, nobody can function without energy. And if you need to buy the energy from the U.S., you're going yeah. to be dependent of the, of the negotiation and, well, and, and you're right about that, because Blinken and Biden and others have been saying they will not allow Russia to um, militarize or to use the uh, energy as a weapon. And that's the whole story behind the Nord Stream pipeline. And I think Seymour Hersh's uh, accusation against Biden, Blinken and others deserves full investigation. But they're not going to do it in the West. They don't want to look at the fact. Yeah, they don't and so that. they say it, it's a big mystery. No one knows who did it, but it was probably Russia. But and I think it, it was started a long time ago because I remember publishing articles seven or eight years ago on the military, uh, military strike in Poland of the U.S. They were already present and visiting schools and so on and so on in Poland or in Czech Republic with uh, with yeah. Obama and and the, uh, the, um, the protection system they wanted to install in, in Czech Republic, in Prague, and our friend organized a protest. So that's not, that was far beyond uh, before well, Ukraine. I, I, David, that's right. It, it really does go back to the collapse of the Soviet Union because it was at that point that this idea of a one superpower, one model of economic development, the neoliberal system in the West, everyone has to adhere to that. And countries that were not doing it, like Iraq and Libya, that were talking about a possible breakaway, were targets for military actions by NATO. Remember, the Libya attack was actually initiated by Cameron and the French, Sarkozy. Uh, the Balkans crisis was uh, Clinton and the British. So the U.S. and Europe have engaged in military action on behalf of economic policy throughout the post-Cold War period. And this is sometimes called the unipolar order. This is breaking down now. And, and the reason uh, I, I talk about the tensions going on in Europe, and we saw in Germany 50,000 people march last Saturday uh, uh, in Berlin. It astonished everyone, and it, it included conservatives and the so-called left, uh, Sarah Wagenknecht was one of the key figures in it. Yeah. And at, at the same time, we're seeing a move toward what Lavrov is calling the global majority, uh, what uh, uh, Modi from India at the G20 meeting, when the G20 refused to endorse a condemnation of Russia, uh, Modi said, we're going to make sure the voice of the global South is heard. Yeah. So it's a breakup occurring across the world. Now, where does Germany go? Germany needed Russia and China for its economy. It's already jettisoned Russia completely, and they're under enormous pressure from the European Union and the U.S. to break with China. Well, who are they going to trade with? Italy? The, the oh, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. It's a very complicated. And the war, I mean, the next step for the U.S. will be China, and we're already seeing happening. That's right. So, 
but can you go back to the protest? How do you see the protest? I mean, what, what are the little bit their quality and how do you see uh, this developing if we, if we can predict? Well, I, I was extremely impressed by the speeches given by Wagenknecht and Schwarzer, the two organizers. They put out a letter calling for negotiations and an end to NATO arms to Ukraine that had over 650,000 signatures in a week. And that was the process that started building this. They're calling for negotiations. They're calling for a, a recognition of the security guarantees of all countries. And this, of course, is what Putin was asking for since 2014. You know, the idea that Russia's actions were unprovoked is just wrong. Putin has been saying that we need security guarantees for Russia. We don't want NATO arms on the Russian border. And Putin has been emphasizing, in fact, what would happen if Russia or China put nuclear weapons in Mexico? No, no. But you, I mean, we had the problem in Cuba with the Cuban. I mean, well, we saw it already with Cuba. And we also. And we saw yeah. it with Venezuela as soon as Venezuela started to get even more independent and the yeah. blockade of Venezuela and, and really the, the complication there. So, um, in, in so the uh, Germans are, are very clear because there was a huge peace movement in Germany in the 80s when the Russians were moving SS-20 missiles into uh, uh, Eastern Europe and the U.S. was bringing their missiles into Germany. There's a huge peace movement in Germany. And then as the Democratic Party in the United States became increasingly taken over by neocons and neoliberals, the same thing is happening with the Social Democrats in, in Germany, and the Greens are the worst. The Greens are the total war party. Baerbock, the foreign minister who's a, from the Green Party, said, we're at war with Russia. So wow. you, you have the leaders, and you know the people are asking, why has Schultz said nothing? Chancellor Schultz said nothing about the Nord Stream pipeline. He was there with Biden in February of last year when Biden said there will be no Nord Stream. So why has he said nothing when this is such a disaster for the German economy? So I think this fuels the idea for Germans that this is an existential crisis for the nation of Germany. And it's about time that people stand up and say something. And, and I have to say, I was extremely impressed by the spirit, the optimism, you know, because Germans tend to be gloomy and pessimistic. This was not true at the rally last week. And I think there are going to be more rallies. There are a couple hundred cities that will have rallies. Things are building in France and Italy uh, and in the United Kingdom. So I think we're about to see a, a tidal wave of protests against NATO and the European Union. A few weeks ago, we, we uh, support a letter than the, uh, the Chile Institute did for the Pope. Any, any, any update on, on that front and how the, the Pope is engaged on to the conflict? Well, the Vatican is continuing to say that they're willing to offer their venue for peace talks uh, with, with no preconditions. Uh, the the uh, secretary to the Pope put out a letter last week, again, reiterating that. The Russians are saying they're perfectly happy to do it. Uh, the Ukrainians are saying there's no, that they're, they're having a big precondition, no talks until what Russia completely withdraws from the Donbass, from Crimea. So they're making preconditions which would preclude any negotiations. And in fact, what they're saying is that they're going to escalate. They want fighter jets and they want long range pre precision missiles so they can hit Crimea. So there's a drumbeat to move toward Crimea uh, even Jake Sullivan, the U.S. National Security Advisor, said this could be a Russian red line. We shouldn't push it, but they're pushing it. So I, I think this is, it's time to take up the Pope's offer. The World Council of Churches has spoken out on this. We're beginning to see uh, religious groups in the United States. Pax Christi was part of the uh, U.S. peace rally in Washington two weeks ago. Yeah. So I, I think people of good faith and, and good religious views see this as a, as a real necessity that we move back from the potential danger of nuclear war uh, and start talking to people on terms of, of mutual benefit. So my last question of the day is about the China uh, peace process plan for Ukraine and the, the, the denial from, from the U.S., 
how did it was receiving in Germany or in Europe? Well, the U.S. was. It's not surprising that the U.S. denied it. the The U.S. is doing everything they can to build up global NATO to contain China. What I found interesting is that Zelensky said that he is willing to talk to China, but what he's saying about the peace agreement, he leaves out 11 of the 12 peace uh, proposals for China. For example, China starts by saying respect for sovereignty of all. Secondly, abandon the Cold War mentality. Now, many people in Germany think this is a pretty good proposal. Uh, there's a lot of support for it from France and Italy. Uh, but in the United States, the war hawks have the upper hand right now. And, and they're essentially saying that not only are they not interested, I mean, Biden said China is not a neutral party. China shouldn't yeah. have any say yeah. in this. I so I think the U.S. is going to sabotage this potential coming from China. So how do you seek to close? How do you how do you see the, 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 the next few steps? Well, I think some of it's going to be determined on the ground in Ukraine. Given that these new weapons are not going to get in, the first Leopard 2 tank that got into Ukraine was blown up and captured by the Russians. You know, I, I think this idea that you can arm your way to a Ukrainian victory when the Ukrainian army has been degraded, and in fact, that's one of the goals of the Russians is to demilitarize Ukraine. Uh, I think, unfortunately, it's going to be very bloody. It's going to be horrible for the people of Ukraine. Uh, also for the Russian army, but I, I think the blame for this goes to NATO. If you keep telling Zelensky, we'll give you all the arms you need till you win, even though in the U.S. there's an acknowledgement, also in Europe, Macron supposedly yeah. uh, told Zelensky, you can't win, you should look for an opportunity to negotiate. I, I think that reality is going to have to come in. I don't know if it's going to be grabbed by the Ukrainians and I think the biggest problem is the U.S. and the British who seriously intend to degrade Russia and won't stop until they've succeeded at that. And that's why we're going to see a tragedy for the people of Ukraine. All right. Thank you very much. I think we can leave it here. Uh, I will be happy to have you again very soon and we can keep this conversation going. Thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. Good talking with you. Thank you so much. That was your show face to face and keep with watching your news on presenza.com and hope to hear from you very soon. Thank you.